This is the WOW Signal Podcast, a production of Dream of the Open Channel. It's June 2013, and this is Episode 8, Cosmic Debris. Welcome. This is your host, Paul Carr. I hope you all got a chance to listen to Episode 7, my interview with Bing Garthright of the National Capital Area Skeptics, over dinner right after UFOCon 13 in May of 2013. That was easily the most fun interview I've ever done. I apologize that because of the background noise, the audio quality wasn't the best. I think if you haven't listened to it, you will enjoy listening to it. And as always... If you have any questions or comments about that episode or any other episodes, you can leave them at the podcast blog, wowsignalpodcast.com, or at the Google Plus community, which you are free to join. We have, so far, over 70 members in the Google Plus community. Why don't you join us? In this episode, we open a new thread, while at the same time furthering an existing one. The new thread is the human exploration colonization, and expansion into the space outside the Earth. The thread we have already picked up, starting in our first episode, was to search for evidence that we are not the first ones there in space, and to understand just why we have not yet got compelling evidence of that. If we are going to go move into space in a big way, not just the sort of flags and footprints adventures that was the Apollo program in the 1960s, then we are going to have to live off the land. Most unmanned spacecraft already do this, harvesting effectively all of their energy from the sun using solar panels. Even the Juno probe, on its way to Jupiter as we speak, is powered by solar energy more than five times further from the sun than the Earth is. Not just energy, but materials will be needed to establish a human civilization in space. Water and its atomic constituents carbon, solid materials, and metals will be essential to building and maintaining human habitats. Water is also a raw material that can be used to make propellants to travel around the solar system. To get to these materials, we will need to dig, collect, and refine them from bodies already in space. These bodies are known as asteroids. Asteroids are essentially just piles of rock left over from the formation of the solar system. There are tens of millions of these rocks in our solar system, most of them billions of years old, and most of them smaller than a city block. They will orbit around the sun for eons until they smash into something, maybe the earth, or until something or someone mines them. There are four reasons I find asteroid mining fascinating and plan to keep covering it in this podcast. The first reason is what we have already talked about, the need for easily obtained resources as humanity expands into the solar system. The second reason is that asteroids contain materials that are getting harder and harder to find here on Earth. Rare metals that can be refined in space and return to Earth. This could help pay for the early stages of asteroid mining. The third reason we are interested in asteroids is that there are millions of them large enough to cause real damage if they ever hit the Earth. Of these millions, most are in orbits that can't intersect the Earth. But so far, 1,400 potentially hazardous asteroids have been identified and more are being discovered every year. It seems likely that eventually we are going to find one headed right for us, hopefully decades in the future. Before that happens, we need a strategy for deflecting asteroids, steering them off course just enough to make them miss. In a future episode, I expect we will address this so far unmet need. 
The fourth reason we are interested in asteroids is that most stars in our galaxy will have asteroids orbiting them. And this would include probably all stars that could potentially host intelligent life. As Duncan Forgan will tell us, we might reasonably expect any sufficiently advanced civilization to mine its local asteroids. This raises the question of whether we could possibly detect telltale signs of asteroid mining in distant solar systems, and hence the presence of intelligent life. A form of SETI that does not require ET to cooperate with us in our search. Dr. Duncan Forgan is a researcher at the University of Edinburgh. His research includes the formation of planetary systems and theoretical SETI. I started by asking him to define a debris disk. The notion of a debris disk, correct me if I'm wrong, that, that's what's left over after a solar system forms, is that correct? Yeah, that, that's roughly what it is. It's kind of like the leftovers of planet formation, and uh, you find them in, in systems of different types of stars, you find them and well, basically wherever we can have the, the knowledge and the technical ability to see them, we tend to see them, uh, and they do tend to form at the very late stages of, a, of planet formation. So in the early stages you have a rather thick disk of dust and gas, uh, and that dust and gas is the feedstock for planets. And over about a million to ten million years, we think, uh, the planet formation process takes place, and the stuff you're left with is what we call debris disks. The, the solar system has what we would describe as debris disks. We would call them the Kuiper belt, for example, so that's the objects in, mm -hmm. in that would be described as debris objects. And the Oort cloud, to some degree, is a debris disk as well, although it's not really disk-shaped in the same way the Kuiper belt is. So these are fairly common objects. So the, the planetary formation process happens pretty rapidly as a respect to the age of the solar system then. Yes, we think it, it is fairly rapid. Um, the process by which you essentially grow dust grains into larger grains and then larger grains into you know, pebbles, uh, boulders, asteroids, um, large objects of that size that then start to collide with each other and then you start to form objects that dominate the gravitational field and start to grow bigger and bigger and so on and so forth. Uh, and by that means we think you can form a variety of planets of different masses from masses like the Earth up to you know, masses of the size of Jupiter, uh, maybe even higher. Um, and the leftovers from that process is, is a debris disk. And it, it does take something like 1 to 10 million years. We know that for a fact because we can look at the gas disks that we see, not just the debris disks, but the disks that are still in the process of either forming planets or being eaten by the star, if you like. So there's a race against time, if you like, between the process where the disk first appears and the process by which the disk is disappeared. So it can be disappeared by the action of the star accreting it, so taking the matter and, and accreting it onto itself. The star can use its own radiation to blow away the disk or the disk itself is assembled into planets. And, and we know that from looking at disk systems that the typical age of these gas disks isn't much more than 1 to 10 million years. So that, if you like, sets the clock at which we have to essentially form all our planets before uh, that time runs out. Now, our telescopes, we can observe debris disks. At what, at what distance can we observe a, a debris disk right now? Uh, most of it is quite local. So the, the debris disks that we see, the reason we see them is because they emit at quite long wavelengths. And it's only really in the last 10 years with some new satellite technology that we've managed to really pin down quite a lot of information about these disks. So... It's quite a new science, it's quite local science, and in that respect, any signal we, we might see of, of asteroid mining in these disks will be very local. It will be within the, you know, a few hundred light years tops. And when uh, the James Webb Space Telescope comes online, will that stretch our ability to see more debris disks? Or? It certainly will, yes. Yeah. So it will be much more sensitive, so it can detect much fainter debris disks and we'll get a better sense of the, the spatial resolution as well. So we'll get to see exactly where different types of dust grain or boulder exist in a disk system. We'll see that a lot clearer with that uh, with James Webb. It won't be amazingly clear, but we will see it more clearly. In your paper, you talk about some of the signatures that we would see from mining, and none of which would be impossible to generate naturally, but 
if we saw all of them together, maybe that would be indicative of of a uh, possible mining signature. Is that did I get that right or? Is yeah, that, that, that's about right. So it's quite hard for us to conclusively say this system is being mined. Um, what we can say is that this system is unusual. Um, and I, I guess the, the three different types of signal we would see, uh, there's three different classes. The first is uh, what we call a chemical disequilibrium or a chemical signature. Uh, and that would simply be the fact that we look at these systems and if our spectroscopy was very good, we could say this system is depleted in certain minerals or certain elements. And if that's the case, then that, that could be interesting in itself. Although that could also just simply be the system is quite weird in that it started out being depleted in those particular elements or minerals at the beginning. So that is, that's one of the different signal methods. And the other two are, are kind of mechanical. Uh, one would be simply that we would see uh, an increased amount of dust in the system uh, as a result of uh, debris being produced by the mining process. So we know that mining on Earth is not a clean process. It produces leftovers of its own. Uh, we call them tailings. So essentially, what we'll be looking for is a large surfeit of tailings um, in these systems. Uh, and then the third class is what we call thermal. Um, and the, the signatures we'd see would be unusual heat. Um, so of course, again, mining isn't a clean process and it, it, it requires energy and it will generate uh, heat in the things we're trying to mine. So if we see that the, the disk has an unusual thermal property, uh, then again, that might be a signal of, of asteroid mining. The sad thing is that some of these signals can be produced naturally. So one of the things that could produce a very hot signature could be the collision of very two large objects uh, at high speed. So obviously there's a lot of energy going on there, and if those two guys hit each other quite hard, then there'll be a lot of heat produced in the collision. Mm -hmm. So that again, that's another example of how we could see something naturally that... Uh, in other circumstances, could have been artificial. Right now, if we had the spatial resolution, and which I'm not sure we do at the moment, but it, we could see multiple hot spots in the disk, and with high degree of variability, that would be a signature of asteroid mining. Yeah, that that's one thing we could do. I mean, this this is obviously quite far in the future because our spatial resolution isn't great, and for the near future, it's not going to be that good, except at very close distance. So yeah, if, if we could see a system that had lots of weird uh, thermal activity going on, and if we could find interesting periodicity in the signal, so perhaps uh, there's a season for mining, um, perhaps there's uh, bursts of activity, then inactivity as the material is, is taken back to a host planet, that kind of information as well could be useful, but obviously that's quite long in the future. Your paper largely addresses data that we we may have in the future uh the data we have right now we don't you don't really see anything out there that says oh this is a candidate system that's being mined well no not really i mean i think if we did then uh, i'd be a bit more vocal about it um <laughs> <laughs> right. but uh sadly we, we don't really have any uh, evidence that any system that we know about has enough of these signatures to say okay this system is weird and we can't fully explain it naturally so let's now look at it from a different angle. Let's look for planets in the system. Let's look for other signatures of habitability or radio signa signals, laser signals, all the usual sort of SETI techniques you might want to then deploy uh, on a candidate. Now, if I understand your paper correctly, the phenomenology you're looking for there is mining that is currently going on, or at least minus the light time. Would it be possible to detect mining that had occurred in a, in the far distant past. That's trickier because you you lose two of the categories of signal. You lose the mechanical and thermal, uh, unless when you say distant past, it's not too distant. So these systems will tend to reset themselves on hundred thousand to million year time scales, especially in the case of things like tailings. It would be quite tricky if if we were looking further back than that to see anything apart from maybe a bizarre lack of chemistry in the system or a depletion of what we might consider to be precious metals. Those things might be indications that something weird has happened to the system, but it wouldn't be enough for me to, you know, put my head above the parapet and say that is an asteroid mine system. I understand. Let's go back to the first part of your paper. Uh, you talked about the 
rationale for asteroid mining. And, and the paper came out in 2011. And about a year later, Planetary Resources made their announcement of, that they were going to pursue asteroid mining. Have you been surprised by anything, any of what you've heard there since in the last year or so? Well, I, I think I can be a little bit smug about all this, actually, um, because in the paper we discuss the fact that it's quite hard for private companies to do this kind of thing because the, the outlay costs are enormous. Uh, I mean, the return profits are staggering if you can do this, get this to work. Um, but the, the initial costs are so large that we didn't think private companies would do this unless they had some kind of assistance from government. And it looks like that's what's going to happen. So I think history has, has repeated itself in the sense that big projects like this are the one we talked about in our paper was the Panama Canal. Uh, again, these kinds of projects don't really work unless you get some kind of private-public partnership um, where government is working with companies to, uh, to shore up the capital and make sure the whole thing actually works and support these companies and help underwrite some of their costs. So in that sense, I think we kind of predicted things quite well. The fact that we'd see two companies was not something I initially thought would happen, although I guess that means that competition might be rife, which we also said would be a very good thing to happen in terms of uh, getting this to work, because the one lesson we've learned from the space race is that if you don't have competition, then nothing happens. You know, Apollo was driven by competition, uh, and when competition disappeared, then the space program kind of fizzled a bit. So if we can get private companies to to compete with each other, then maybe we can see uh, progress happening at a more rapid scale than we would otherwise. As Duncan Forgan pointed out, we're going to need better infrared telescopes to detect signs of asteroid mining. And so far, we only know how to detect mining that is currently going on. That makes it pretty much a long shot, until our telescopes are far beyond what they can do with the current generation. When we hear from Ben Wright McGee in an upcoming episode, we'll talk more about strategies for detecting alien civilizations that existed long ago. As you've probably heard lately, it looks as if asteroid mining by the hubristic primates from planet Earth is poised to happen, and private companies are leading the way. We all know about planetary resources, the well-funded effort led by Peter Diamandis. They are taking a fairly cautious approach with their investors' money, playing a long game and first developing the technology for prospecting, and then beginning mining operations at a small scale and ramping up. Planetary Resources, however, is not the only company that wants to get into asteroid mining. There are others. And the Cinderella team in this tourney, Stott Space, has more aggressive plans to beat its asteroid mining competitors to the punch. I spoke to CEO Isaac Stott about the prospects for asteroid mining within the next few years. Thanks for joining me on the WOW Signal podcast. This particular episode will have the theme of asteroid mining and asteroids in general. And I wanted to talk to you about your company's very ambitious plans for asteroid mining and as well as space colonization. You have on your website, you mentioned a three-step plan, having to do the movement, then mining, and then what you call facilitate space. Can you kind of step us through that plan and, and, and give us a bit of a feel for the timeline they're talking about? Well, as you you know, you know, see on the website, and then also when we were doing our Indiegogo, um, the three steps. The first step is, is that we, we, we want to get people excited about this. We want to get people excited about space. We want to educate them. We want them to get them up to speed on what's really going on right now. And that is, is that the commercial industry... Um, NASA's taken a back seat and the private industry is is really taken off in the, in the space industry um, and where we feel our part in, in that is uh, we want to supply the abundant resources that we're going to need uh, for developing space and we feel that asteroid mining is the, the most feasible 
So the first step is asteroid mining. Uh, the second step is uh, manufacturing. We need to get that facility, in, uh, 3D manufacturing facility in space. I'm guessing. I, I love 3D printing technology. I think it's a very promising technology. And so far, that's what I'm thinking that uh, would be a great avenue. And I'm pursuing those technologies. So we want to we want to get those manufacturing facilities so we can start building the infrastructure. And then the third one is the colonizing colonization and expanding into our solar system. Once we develop the technologies to mine asteroids, they're all over the solar system. Once we get that technology going, then we can just um, hop from one asteroid to another and keep exploring. We'll have uh, the water that we need for life support uh, and uh, fuel, and then we'll also have all, all the other elements that we'll need to... Uh, you know, keep sustain life and, and, and build more infrastructure that we need. How soon do you think we can do that? We have the technology to, to go asteroid mining. We could be on an asteroid and be mining it before 2020. We can do it this decade. Um, planetary resources and deep space industries are um, taking the less risky route. They want to find an avenue that will make them cash flow positive first before they start generating or before they start developing their, their mining module. However, I, I think that's good and all, but I, I take the much more aggressive approach and let's just build a mining module. Let's get it over there. I don't even care what's on the asteroid. Mine it, bring it back, and then we analyze it. Because it doesn't matter what resources are on that asteroid, they're going to have intrinsic value. And they're going to be applied to anything, even if it's the most useless dirt, heat shielding, and radiation shielding. And those things right there are are invaluable in space right now. The the business case for asteroid mining right now, you feel, is is it in the is just the raw materials in low Earth orbit, or is it platinum grip metals? Where do you think the profits are? I, I can't even begin to describe it, all the avenues of, of potential for uh, markets, uh, for for the, the amount of money that can be made. And it's not even about the money. You can pursue any avenue in extraterrestrial mining, and there's money to be made. Uh, you mentioned platinum. Platinum is rare here on Earth. It's actually not a natural growing resource. Every platinum that's been mined here on Earth has been... Uh, it has come from an asteroid impact. So essentially we're just going to the source of platinum. What's rare here on Earth isn't rare in space. Uh, it's in high abundance and high concentrations. So yeah, there's a lot of value in, uh, in, in just mining platinum, if, if that's what you wanted to do. If we were to bring platinum here to Earth, that limit of cost would disappear. These technologies... Um, technology would explode from that. Platinum is a very valuable metal, not just in price, but also for the applications that it can be used for. So, I mean, every day we're finding a new use for platinum. You have a design for a mining module? Yes, I do. How does it work? Okay, so we have our mining head, um, which is in the, in, the, in the base there, the middle, and then we've got those four cylinders around it. Those are the return vehicles. Okay, uh, combined with the four return vehicles, we should be be, be able to bring back a hundred tons of asteroid regolith. And that's a fair amount, and that's exactly what we want to do. We don't want to bring back a few rocks. We want to bring back something considerable that we can do something with. The first return vehicle will be capable of entering Earth's atmosphere, and the other three will stay in Earth's, Earth's orbit, and we'll be utilizing those resources. In space, so we've got our, our mining head, which should have an auger. Uh, we'll have a solar concentrator on there to amplify the solar or the the electrical output that we're going to need to power this. Uh, we're going to have our four mining heads, each, or I'm sorry, our, our four return vehicles, and then we're all. How we're going to get there is through ion thrusters. So each one of these return vehicles is going to have its own ion thrusters, and together we'll be able to actually make the trip over there pretty fast because we're going to have all those combined ion thrusters going. 
but then they'll also detach when they're full and use utilize their own ion thruster and, and come back with the resources. I, I mean, you must have done some cost calculations for this. What's it going to cost? It's a good, uh, good question. I mean, when we first started this, we were thinking it was going to be in the billions, you know, based on, on what NASA's done with their, their money. But we, uh, the more research we've done, we realized that the cost is much cheaper than that. Uh, from start to finish, $400 million. Um, obviously, we don't need all that money right up front right now. Um, a good portion of that money is going to be going towards launch costs. So we're not going to need that right up until the point of launching. We probably need about 50 to $100 million, uh, for developing, prototyping, testing, and getting everything ready for, for semi and, and outer space. Uh, so $400 million, and for that you're going to return 40 tons of just unrefined regolith? Uh, it's 100 tons. 100 tons, sorry. So um, each vehicle has 25 tons, is that? Two of them are going to carry 20 tons each, and then the other two are going to carry... No, I, I'm sorry. Let me correct this. The first two are going to do 10 tons each, and then the second two are going to carry 40 tons each. Um, now, these, these it, it's been pretty variable the last two months because we've been uh, altering it because we want to fit it inside, make it so we're going to be able to fit it on a, on a Falcon 9. Um, so we've been adjusting sizes and everything, but I believe currently right now we have two at 10 tons. The second one's going to be like a backup to going into Earth's atmosphere in case the first one fails. So we have a redundancy there. And then the second two, they're going to be, they're going to have these uh, expandable Kevlar bags so they're going to be able to expand into something bigger, and they'll be able to hold a whole lot more. The other two, though, will be a fixed cylinder. So you can enter, re-enter Earth with 10 tons of, of payload. How, how are you going to planning to do that? Um, well, like I said, these, these first two, they're going to be designed uh, to, to handle Earth's atmosphere. You know, they're going to need to have the heat shields. I was actually talking to uh, Phil Metzger, Dr. Phil Metzger, Yesterday, uh, he's a, a NASA scientist at the Kennedy Space Center. He's actually been working with his team for the last 10 years, developing uh, mining technologies and figuring this stuff out. And he was actually, he actually mentioned a really good idea of how we could do this. Um, Rob Mueller actually did all the calculations into this. But what, what uh, how they would do it is they would take the raw regolith, like you get gravel or rocks, you know, kind of the useless stuff that's not, you know, platinum or gold. You can take that and then you can use that as your heat shield. Um, he did something to it to where he was able to design it and, and make it into heat shields for to put around your return vehicle. So you're actually utilizing the resources that you mined to get yourself back in Earth's orbit. I see. And then, and then also use the water for fuel and everything to get you, because you need to have the, the right speeds get, getting into Earth's orbit, or Earth's atmosphere. Yeah, the, there's, a, there's a technical paper on your website. Is that still pretty much your basic architecture? Yes, it is. If anybody's interested in the details, they can go to that paper. You're, you're expecting to return... A very large amount of regolith in uh, what seven or eight years from now is that that's your plan yeah we, we want to be on an asteroid it's very possible for us to be on an asteroid by 2018 um, and then we would love to have these uh, return vehicles the first one coming in by 2020 mm -hmm. um, now this really depends on our funding level how soon we get it you know if we're able to maintain our schedule uh, but it is possible for us to be uh, on an asteroid by 2018. So that would put you probably well ahead of your uh, your competitors then. Yeah. They're, they're, they're moving much more cautiously. Um, yes. So so that leads to the next obvious question. Where's, where do you think that $400 million is going to come from? Well, um, 
I've been working really hard in, in attracting investors. Um, right now, I'm, I'm getting together a panel of investors. I'm probably going to meet up with them in the next two weeks uh, to present uh, our business plan. Um, seven, eight guys. Right now, we're, we just need the money for the next research round. We have right now an outline of the technologies stating that this is possible. So essentially, we have the pieces of the puzzle on the same table. Now we need the money to put this puzzle, these puzzle pieces together to get it down to the nuts and bolts, saying, okay, this is exactly how we're going to do it. This is exactly how our, our mining module is going to look. And we're going to be able to do this and this and this on such and such dates and such and such time and such and such cost. Right now, we're, we're looking for about a $2 million research round. It should be about a six-month study. And we will be utilizing star technology and research, a very credible company. Uh, the president is Jerome Pearson. So as soon as we get that money, we'd love to get them to, to do the research and, and get this going for us. Um, so right now... That's where we're at for, for our money, and that's what we're really working towards is this $2 million research round. After that, we would reconvene with these investors, and we would present what, what our findings are, and uh, if they feel good with it, you know, they'll, they'll take us to that next stage. Have you picked a target asteroid yet for your first mission? No, we haven't, uh, plain and simple, but we have done a lot of research. And we have done a lot of looking into it. We generalize. We know ex generally what we want to go after. We want to go after a near-Earth asteroid so it will be crossing Earth's orbital trajectory. So it will come close to Earth. Um, and we want to... Size doesn't really matter. The And actually the, the type of asteroid, like C-class, S-class, or M-class, we, we're not really interested in the type. We want to find one that fits good in, in getting to the asteroid at such and such a time, and then also when we're ready to return the return vehicles back to Earth, that it's also in a good position for us to get back there. So there's a lot of variables that we need to, to figure. We do have a couple candidates in mind. I'm not going to name any specifics. We still need to do some more in-depth research on that, and that will come from this research round this in-depth uh, nuts and bolts study that we're going to do, this six-month study. Okay. One more question um, having to do with the recent announcement by NASA of their plans to uh, go retrieve a small near-Earth object and bring it back into near-Earth, probably uh, one of the Lagrange points. Has that affected your plans at all? You know, Phil Metzger yesterday asked me this. He's like, you know, how do you fit into this? You know, what does this do for you? What does this do for NASA? And originally, about last year, about this time, uh, we were stating that we did, we, we wanted to go to an asteroid. We wanted to capture one and bring it back to Earth's orbit. But then when I got the smarter people on board, former NASA scientists, they crunched some numbers and we just weren't seeing it as a very feasible with the current rockets that we have um so we decided to just go straight for building a mining module and go into an asteroid now with with what's going on with nasa they want to use their orion capsule and their sls rocket so the newest latest and greatest from nasa and they want to use those at and go to this asteroid it'll be as like a testing this will this will be a test for it to see if it's capable you know how well it does as far as going over to this asteroid and bringing it back. I I think it's great that NASA's doing it. I, I think that that not only attracts more attention to to what asteroids, what what's out there, but it also educates people on what an asteroid is. Um, I'm thinking that if they do succeed, I think that's great. I would love to, to be the one to mine it. <laughs> That would make my job a lot easier if they had it in, in L1 or L2. We just go over there. It's, it's already, you know, stabilized. Um, it's fairly close to Earth, and we can start mining it. I know that NASA would want to do a lot of extensive research, and that would give them the, also the opportunity to, to land an astro or astronaut on the as asteroid. Um, 
to accomplish what Obama said a few years ago. But yeah, I think it's good. I, at, at right now, I don't know specifically everything that it's going to do to uh, to affect us or influence us, but I think it's great. And depending on uh, if they're able to pull it off or not, then I'll, you know, we'll discuss further how how we want to. Uh... Okay, Isaac, uh, is there anything else that I I didn't ask you that you wish I had asked you? No, there really isn't anything uh, other than, you know, uh, it, this is pretty exciting. If you don't know anything about asteroids, you should get to know them. Uh, it's, it's a lot of potential. This civilization right now, we're, we're in a tier one right now, you know, where we've, we're utilizing the resources of our entire planet. But we're starting to feel the pressure. You know, oil costs are going up. We're starting to see, you know, a, a time stamp on, on how long that's going to last rare earth metals and other rare earth resources, we're starting to see that there may be a limit within the next 40 to 100 years of when those resources run out. Um, we're starting to see a lot of pollution in earth. We're starting to feel this pressure, and we really need to get out of the planet and start utilizing the resources that are available in space, asteroids, the moon, Mars. There's no environment to destroy up, up there. Here there is. So if we started transferring these mining and processing plants into space, then the quality of life here on Earth gets a lot better. That pressure, actually, all of that, once we start utilizing the resources in space, all of that goes away. It solves all those problems. So, yeah, with that said, I'm, I think that's about it. Okay, well, thanks, Isaac, uh, and good luck with your plans. Hope to hear about you very soon in the press. Okay, bye. Thank you, Paul. Take care. So, right now, the increasingly crowded asteroid mining field runs the gamut from cautious and well-funded to aggressive and still looking for investors. If you have a substantial amount of cash available that's not spoken for, you may want to consider investing in asteroid mining. Scientist, educator, and space entrepreneur Ben Wright McGee agrees. I know you've done a lot of field geology. Yeah. And, and so, asteroid mining is it is it is it real? Is it can it happen? <laughs> I know it's not much uh, uh, happening now, but yeah, actually, um, you know, I. I Full disclosure, that's why I became a geologist. <laughs> uh, I, uh, what my, my college project, I, I led a team back at the University of Wyoming to try and figure out, actually do a proof of concept on how you would separate a resource mineral, uh, a metal, for instance, from its matrix in a microgravity environment. How do you melt it? How do you smelt it? And we designed a little reactor. It was a centrifuge built in. It was pretty cool. Uh, so, I mean, to, to answer your question, yes, and, and <laughs> hope, hopefully... <laughs> Uh, yes, soon. Uh, and, you know, the, and the devil's going to be in the details, of course. Yeah. Uh, just like when we went up and started, um, you know, attempting to mine up in Alaska and the Yukon and the Gold Rush, the guys who actually went up there to do it's one thing to talk about it, and it's another thing to actually implement the technology we're going to have to use. It's going to be adaptable on the fly. Things aren't going to work the way that we think they do, especially because we've never tried in situ resource utilization in any environment even approximating that. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you could make some arm-waving arguments that maybe Antarctica or, uh, you know, something like that gives you a, a sense for what you might need to do. But a fully automated system has its own unique problems. And even if we send people, they offer solutions, but their own set of, of unique problems. So I think it will be challenging. But, yeah, I, I don't think that this is, that this is all... Um, you know, pie in the sky stuff. I think we actually, every step that we technologically need to do it, we've done. We just haven't done it all at once together, you know, in a concerted effort. Mm -hmm. And what do you think the market for that is? Is it is it in the metals? Is it in the hydrogen? <laughs> the oxygen? Well, I've, I've got my own, um, my own ideas about this. You know, the one thing, again, letting, giving everything away here, uh, the one thing people neglect to think about it's, it's easy to think about the platinum group metals. You know, those are high dollar targets here on Earth now. 
Uh, but one of the things that people don't tend to consider is what are high dollar targets there? And there's a premium right now to launch anything off of the Earth's surface, even just in low Earth orbit. It's about $10,000 a pound. So if you just wanted, say, a chunk of bland radiation shielding, about yay big, you're made out of anything, base silicate rock, well, that's going to cost $10,000 a pound. It costs maybe five bucks here, but that's how much it costs to launch it. So if you actually gain control, even of some non-precious material out there, and you manage to do anything crude with it, you even made an arm-waving argument that you could just you know, mesh rocks onto the outside of your spaceship and reduce your, your, uh, your internal radiation dose, you can charge $10,000 a pound for that stuff, maybe $9,000 a pound, and now you've saved whoever's buying it $1,000 a pound over what it would cost to launch it from Earth. And that's where I think the real economic story starts to open up. It's not necessarily sending it back here, which, of course, we will, but it's how it's going to be used amongst the people up there because that's the great divide is launching stuff out of Earth's gravity well. So that's, that's the hidden economy I think it's going to show up. Do you think uh, refueling stations are a good idea? I think it's an excellent idea. I mean, you know, especially, I don't know why we haven't done it already. You know, Skylab proved that you could take the upper stages of large rockets and use them. And it's simpler to make a fueling depot out of those than have a habitable space. So, you know, again, the great problem with launching things from Earth is weight. And so if there's any way to save weight, you save an amazing amount of money. And that's the way to do it. I mean, whether, whether you're sending something to the moon, you're sending it to an asteroid, a near-Earth asteroid back, you're going to Mars, no matter how you slice it, if you can find any way to save weight and pay that forward somehow, which means, yeah, uh, fuel depots, yes, absolutely, I don't know why we haven't done it already. DJ Spooky there with The Vengeance of Galaxy 5. My own thoughts on human asteroid mining? I like what Planetary Resources is doing. They have done everything right so far and are building the right culture and a realistic experience base to make it happen. As Ben Wright and McGee pointed out, the devil is in the details and no one can know for certain at this point which details will be important. I don't know that planetary resources will be the first to profit from asteroid mining, but once someone does, the game is changed irreversibly and forever, populating our solar system first with our robots and then with ourselves. We will then become the exact sort of civilization that Duncan Forgan wants to look for in the debris disks around other stars and we will have a far more refined idea of what to look for. We don't really know what is going to happen or what will be the killer app of space commerce. When the first explorers left from Europe to conquer the New World, they had no idea that tobacco would turn out to be more important than gold or spices in future trade with that continent. However, we do know 
that the most readily obtainable materials to build a civilization in space are found among the cosmic debris. And that's no jive. And now, the Wow Signal Podcast, seal of podcast approval for podcasting as part of the podcast. Every episode since episode four, I single out one particularly meritorious podcast, other than this one, for recognition. At wowsignalpodcast.com, there's a list of these with links to their homepages. The fifth Wow Signal Podcast Seal of Approval for Podcasting is awarded to Sid Smith's Podcast from the Yellow Room. This is a music podcast hosted by music writer and author of the definitive biography of King Crimson, Sid Smith. A frequent writer of published reviews and sleeve notes, Sid is well connected in the European indie music scene and gets all kinds of interesting and possible to find music to play on his podcast. He has such an engaging personality that you feel you can just relax, suspend like and dislike, and let him introduce you to new stuff. I really enjoy it, and often end up tracking down some of the CDs to add to my collection. That's Sid Smith's Podcast from the Yellow Room. Linkage at the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com. You have just heard the Wow Signal Podcast, podcast seal of approval for podcasting as part of the podcast. Thanks for listening. I hope you're as interested in our future in space as I am. I'd love to hear what you think about this episode and the podcast in general. If you want to comment on this episode or any episode of the Wow Signal Podcast, you can leave a comment on the blog at wowsignalpodcast.com or join our Google Plus community. There's a link to the community on the homepage at wowsignalpodcast.com. If you want to be on the podcast, just email me at wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com and we can discuss this. As always, I want to incorporate listener comments and questions as part of the podcast. I'd also like to hear from you if you are a musician and would like me to play some of your music on the podcast. Just email me at wowsignalpodcast at gmail.com and let me know how I can listen to your work. Thank you for joining me on this episode of the Wow Signal Podcast. I want to thank our guests, Dr. Duncan Forgan, Isaac Stott of Stott Space, and Ben Wright McGee of Astro Wright Spaceflight Consulting, our musical contributors, Lucha Tistas, Mike Griffin, Jason Robinson and DJ Spooky. Links to learn more about all these folks will be in the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com. Also, thanks to our voiceover artists, Joyce Abma and Aaron Carr. And now, here's a little more music from DJ Spooky to take us out. This has been Episode 8 of the WOW Signal Podcast. The spoken content of the WOW Signal Podcast is distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 license. All music is presented with the permission of the artists. 
To comment on this episode or for more information about asteroids, asteroid mining, Dr. Forgan's work, or the music in this podcast, please visit the show notes at wowsignalpodcast.com. Thank you.